<clears throat> okay, <clears throat> Arthur Erickson. Uh, yesterday, actually, it was his birthday. So he was born on, on, on the 20th of May, 1924, and he died in 2009. A very important uh, Canadian architect. So Arthur Charles Erickson uh, was a Canadian, Canadian architect and urban planner. He studied Asian languages at the University of British Columbia and later earned a degree from McGill University School, School of Architecture. He is renowned for designing some of the most re recognizable buildings and sites in Canada, including Roy Thompson Hall, Robson Square, the Museum of Glass, and the Simon Fraser University campus. Uh, here is the man, uh, elegant as architects usually are. Uh, he might uh, appear to be a little bit arrogant, but I don't think he was. I have uh, I, uh, here a picture with him, uh, young and uh, like here. Uh, he looks like a serious and intense man. He certainly loved architecture. And I think uh, architecture in return loved him because he did have a lot of success. If by success, we mean, uh, you know, having a lot of commissions, interesting commissions and building. Some drawings by Arthur uh, Erickson. Um, also interesting that he first studied uh, um, uh, languages, uh, you know, and uh, you know, it shows a humanist, you know, a man who was interested in letters at the beginning, and then he, he turned to architecture. This, uh, this does say something, I think. It's not very common, this. At that time, of course, uh, the, all the drawing was done manually. Uh, he was also attracted by uh, so-called visionary uh, drawings, like, for example, this one. He took risks and uh, in his built work as well. Well, some of his works are a little bit, uh, <clears throat> I don't know <clears throat> very well how to describe them, a little bit um, maybe uh, uh, excessively optimistic vis-a-vis -vis technology, vis-a-vis -vis even capitalism. Uh, they are a little bit predictable sometimes, but not always. Layered landscapes, drawings from the Canadian architectural archives, uh, you'll see some, some remarkable buildings by him. So we start from 1955, uh, this house in West uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, um, Canada. And uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit uh, hard to see with this uh, rather small picture. Uh, here is the architect with a cat, I guess, in his hands, in his arms. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, he's an architect who is, uh, or who was, um, you know, capable of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, betraying himself, so to speak, uh, in, in the sense of experimenting with unexpected uh, solutions. But one thing he didn't give up that is being a modern. 1958, Philberg residence, in, again in British Columbia. Uh, you know, he, he benefited from a remarkable uh, landscape, uh, from special uh, building sites. Uh, and, uh, you know, that helped, of course.
his, his modernism is not very inhibited and not very inhibiting. As you can see, he also uses, just like Marcel Breuer, uh, organic uh, or natural materials uh, like stones. So he's, he's not dogmatic. Another house in Alberta, Canada, 1960. Um, so he was not truly the, uh, the, the, the victim of systems. Although he uses some kind of a cerebrality, but not, uh, uh, not uh, um, you know, excessively and uh, not uh, obsessively. Now it's true; these are not uh, very modest houses. You know, they are not cottages. They are they are houses for well-to-do people. Another house, 1963. He didn't build just uh, private houses. We'll arrive at some very big projects, public uh, public projects. 1963, the Graham House, West Vancouver, British Columbia. This is one of his best uh, known and, and best uh, uh, accomplished, uh, you know, private residences. And I think it's quite nice because it it it, it plays with various volumes. And there is the stream of water that insinuates itself underneath the building. Uh, I like this building very much uh, because it has a balance between man and nature. So man, meaning the architect, is, is um, um, symbolized, so to speak, by the rectangular grid, uh, uh, the grid of the building, but then he allows for the organicity of nature to, to assert itself quite, uh, quite strongly. It's, it's, a, it's one of his best buildings. Well, we know the falling water by Frank Lloyd Wright, but is this building less you know, uh, accomplished uh, or inspiring than uh, the falling water? I don't know. I mean, uh, it's different from what Frank Lloyd Wright did, and yet they have something similar in the sense that both buildings have the water not to look at, but part of the, of the architecture almost. As opposed to the building by Frank Lloyd Wright, here is not a falling water, it's a rather static uh, piece of water, but uh, otherwise there are a few resemblances in a way. Nineteen sixty-five. This is a, a public building, uh, institutional building, uh, and uh, you you probably are a little bit surprised after those uh, private residences. We look now at a at a tall uh, building that uh, shows a different Arthur Erickson. But this is also convincing. In, although it could have been maybe designed, maybe to an extent by IMP. Um, a versatile architect. Now another residence, 1965, Smith residence, West Vancouver, British Columbia. 
uh, he is uh, uh, quite uh, good with these uh, private residences. Uh, you know, he is uh, uh, geometrical, but also uh, shows a degree of freedom which um, um, would qualify his buildings, uh, his private residences for some kind of a geometrical uh, organicism, or I don't know how to call it, uh, uh, geometrical organic uh, architecture. Which is almost oxymoronic because you would expect the word organic to, to, to be removed from whatever the word uh, geometrical means. Well, in this case, we kind of have both. It must be very pleasant to live in this house, wouldn't it? It is an optimistic architecture, um, still believing in the possible and desired and desirable marriage between man and nature. There is no disenchantment here, to use a word uh, frequently used by Olgiati in his book uh, about non-referential architecture. The architecture of Arthur Erickson is not disenchanted nor disenchanting. Simon Fraser University, this, this is a big uh, architectural uh, intervention and uh, you know it's it's a very ample building where Clearly, Arthur Erickson shows himself not just as an architect, but also to an extent as an urban planner. It's a monumental building, as you can see. To me, it is clear that Arthur Erickson had the soul of, a, of an artist, or that maybe also the soul of a poet. He, there are sculptural uh, attributes to some of his buildings. And uh, yes, he was an architect, but uh, somehow you have the feeling that he knew something about something else as well. And when we read that he studied some, you know, he studied uh, uh, letters, uh, you know, let, literature, and uh, you know about uh, you know the, the Asian culture before he turned to architecture. This is, uh, I think, uh, somehow uh, shown in his work. Uh, Caton House. Why do I say somehow? Because I, the influence of Asia is shown in his uh, um, sensitive handling of the dialogue with nature. And it's known that the Orient and Asia uh, are, are um, uh, you know, uh, display a particular sensitivity uh, about uh, this relationship, man, nature. Another interesting house here, uh, different from the previous ones. Uh, he benefited again of very special settings but I think he brilliantly designed uh, in, a, in a way which cannot be uh, ignored.
And you, you, you can see the sculptor is a sculptural architect. The government of Canada pavilion at Expo 70 Osaka won top architectural award in 1970. And uh, here it is. Uh, I don't know exactly the symbolism that it, uh, it uh, tried to convey, but uh, it is uh, in a way a uh, stage design. I mean, it, 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 it seems to evoke some kind of a meaning uh, unless you know the specifics of the program that uh, Canada wanted to um, to honor through this pavilion, it's hard to tell. But but it is an interesting uh, it is an interesting architecture and unexpected after we saw the house that we just saw. Now a temple uh, for this I don't know what this is Kalsa D1 Society in Vancouver. 1970, um, again, you can see the influence from Asia. And this is probably uh, some kind of a religious order or sect, uh, you know, uh, for, for uh, an Asian group. And it is, uh, it is uh, not just at the top, but uh, and this fortress-like uh, building and, uh, you know, rotating volumes and that, that uh, structure the top evokes uh, maybe an esoteric form of spirituality, one that we are not familiar with. The University Hall, uh, University of Lethbridge uh, in Alberta, also in Canada, also a, a large uh, university and a large building. And I think quite impressive. And look at this, you know, it's, um, this is not a little building. Uh, it's, 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 it, it asserts itself with, uh, with strength uh, in, a, in a landscape which could have been uh, who knows where. The idea is very simple. You have this uh, varied uh, natural landscape and then the human gesture, the building is, uh, you know, contrasting with the, with the natural landscape. And uh, there is this uh, dialectical relationship between one and the other. So it's, it's uh, harmony through contrast. An elementary school from 1973 in, in Vancouver. This is also an interesting work. And you can see his, his works are varied and uh, uh, almost each one has a specific indi individuality. And it must be very pleasant. It must have been very pleasant, and it must be very pleasant to 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 be a kid, a school uh, uh, a pupil uh, in, in inside this school. It's very informal, the you know the the class, as you can see. No rigid uh, ateliers, no rigid classes, but uh, you know a central, open, uh, highly highly luminous. Uh, you know, it's important for the psychology of the students, of the pupils to, 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 to learn in, a, in, in such an environment. I, I, I imagine that someone who, who is taught in such a school is very open-minded and uh, loves transparency. Uh, 
because it's not a restrictive uh, way of, uh, of of teaching. And look, you know, the class is taking place, you know, in a circle almost around the table while other kids are playing on the floor. And, you know, this is freedom. And uh, the effects are important on, 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 on the kids. Now, this is a longhouse from 1976, uh, which inspired the Haida longhouse, inspired the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia. Uh, another important work uh, of uh, Arthur Erickson. Sorry for the pictures are a little bit, um, the resolution is problematic, but you can still see that it's, it's a rhythmical uh, sculptural work. Uh, and, uh, you know, not governed strictly by, uh, by functionalism, but by other values. Representational, symbolic, uh, emotional, you name them. Otherwise, yes, there is a little bit of a system in his work, you know, this, uh, uh, I would say that perhaps the relationship between the rational and the irrational uh, in terms in, in, uh, in percentages, maybe, maybe I am, it's a little bit risky what I'm saying, but I, I feel like saying that in, in the relationship between reason and the feeling, uh, um, in his work, and you know, from what we saw until now, perhaps reason um, re would receive, could receive 51%, and uh, the unreason, or uh, you could name it in other ways, uh, 49%. But uh, it's very risky to use numbers and percentages in uh, in in this uh, in this field. The reason I said that there seems to be a, a surplus, just a slight a surplus of, of reason is because or, or of calculation, because you see here there is a rhythmicity which is um, rather rational than, than otherwise. But all in all, uh, I think he achieves a, a balanced architecture. Because he, here, even though we have this, because there are, they are not really in, on a, on a, in the same plane, uh, you know, they appear to be, I mean, the, the spacing between them appears to be different, not equal. Thus, the, 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 the immeasurable, uh, to use the word by Louis Kahn, or the, 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 um, the irrational uh, insinuates itself. A subway station, 1978 in Toronto, uh, a large subway station. But even here, he didn't do an indifferent job at all. Uh, you know, it's a creative work. And the ceiling does the job because of the diagonals. Um, you know, uh, all of a sudden, this is not an indifferent uh, work of uh, for a subway station. Another subway station, 1978 in Toronto, uh, different from the previous one, still uh, built by uh, Arthur Erickson. The Evergreen Building in Vancouver, 1978. 
Now, this was before the uh, obsessive concerns with the green, with green architecture and so on. This was 1978. So he anticipated somehow, you know, the, the, the realities of our time. But this was done almost uh, 50 years ago. There is a system, and maybe this system made me think of that 51% of reason, but uh, even here, because he played, placed, uh, uh, you know, plants and green material uh, going all the way up the building, um, th th there is a, uh, a degree of freedom which um, balances the, the system, the rational system. To an extent, maybe not sufficiently, but to an extent. This is a uh, an, another important work by Ericsson, uh, you know, a, a court, a, a palace of justice, if you want. Uh, and uh, I was talking with a doctoral student who uh, prepares a doctoral uh, paper or her PhD work on um, palaces of justice. And uh, she did comment properly that here, you know, when you go to a tribunal, to a, you know, to a court, um, and you encounter this kind of luminous uh, space, you, you are normally inclined to, to believe that uh, there will be justice and there will be transparency and nothing uh, ominous or dark would take place. And indeed, it's, it's uh, reassuring, you know, to, to, to have this kind of architecture for, uh, for a building where you know, stern matters are uh, handled. So you, you can tell that here there was an architect. Well, maybe more than what, what these buildings behind uh, show us. The presence of the architect is uh, manifested here with, uh, with clarity, I would say. I like this, uh, this other architects used it too, you know, where you have this kind of arrangement with the steps. So you can walk up the stairs or you can uh, walk up the ramp and it's interesting you are you could zigzag with a ramp or go rather you know straight to where you want to arrive using the steps it's an interesting idea and it's it's it works and you you have two options you know Uh, Roy Thompson Hall, another uh, important work by him, if by important we mean a large building. Um, I, I, I like more the interior than the exterior. Uh, not so much the, the space or the room itself, but uh, there are, I, I have seen nice pictures of the ceiling. You know, like this one, it's, it's almost surreal. It has something of a peacock's tail. Knapp Laboratories in Cambridge, uh, England, 1983. So he built outside of, of, of Canada as well.
this work is a little bit dry for my taste, uh, a little bit too polished, a little bit uh, uh, slick, but uh, anyway, King's Landing, Toronto, 1984. Uh, he works well, he worked well with diagonals and uh, he was able also to fragment them. So there is variety or multiplicity in unity. housing, a housing complex. Canadian Chancery, Chancery uh, in Washington, DC, a diplomatic work, uh, you know, the, so, you know, this is a political building in a way, it's, you know, uh, it's function related to diplomacy a little bit uh, to, for my taste, let's see, the 1989, yeah, it was a deadly time for architecture because it was very difficult to uh, subtract oneself from uh, postmodernism. And you can see some touches of postmodernism here in this, uh, this part of the building. Otherwise, it is an Arthur Erickson building, but here there are, uh, is, is, is what he paid. I mean, uh, his... Uh, <laughs> is a tribute uh, to, um, uh, to postmodernism, an unfortunate one. Or maybe also he wanted to symbolize authority, power, uh, you know, a being it's, you know, uh, uh, political, uh, political gesture in a way, rebuilding for, uh, for the Canadian uh, government, but in Washington. I don't know if he intended this, you know, this, this, it is a disjunction here between the structure at the top and in the corner and then what's happening here. This is a little too explicitly related to colonnades and history and, uh, you know, uh, the circle also amplifies that feeling and uh, I don't know. I personally think he could have done something else, but it's not for me to say it. Uh, 1989, a civic center in Ontario, quite large. As you can see, he did his uh, private buildings, the private residences, but also he built a very large uh, buildings for the public uh, consumption, in this case, case, consumption almost. Here also there is a tribute to postmodernism, which is a little bit problematic. I think, but because you know those columns, although though although abstracted, are still columns. Those very columns that uh, someone like Wolf Briggs uh, hates, and I understand why, because those those columns represent a, a past uh, world, a world that is not ours any longer. I mean, we still have. Uh, you know, people in power and we still have institutions, so we still have columns, but um, this regular, you know, equidistant columns uh, somehow don't, uh, don't uh, express the, the realities of our time or they shouldn't. Convention Center, San Diego, California, 1989. This is more futuristic, it's like an architectonic machine. And I think it is interesting. Um, it is uh, uh, not using those columns that we saw in the previous works. And, and this in itself is a, is, a, uh, is a quality. And there are these things uh, that, that surprises one, you know, indeed uh, this, this corridor, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this empty space, the horizontal, long and round, uh, is something of science fiction. Fresno City Hall in uh, Fresno, California, 1991, a large work, um, again, a, a mega, a mega building, um, 
what can we say? So this is in California. And now um, you can understand better perhaps the work looking at the model. Although it has, it is a monolithic building uh, because of the rift, because of the cut in the middle, it becomes uh, uh, sufficiently unstable, so to speak, so that monolithical side is not crashing. Now, this is the University of California, 1991. Not all his works are exceptional, but uh, even those that are not ex exceptional have, have uh, some qualities. Two California Plaza, Los Angeles, two towers. As you can see them, uh, these two, a lot of glass, uh, yeah, two skyscrapers, you know, what can we say? Are they very different from other skyscrapers? I wouldn't say so, but they are well built and uh, they have a certain elegance, but nothing truly very audacious or, or stunning or, uh, you know, surprising. Now a library, University of British Columbia, 1997. Uh, lots of glass here, you know, I only hope uh, through that glass, the sunlight doesn't, uh, I hope it doesn't reach the books. Uh, but uh, the building is, um, you know, I guess, okay to an extent, but too much glass for a library. Uh, books don't like natural light, sunlight especially. Uh, and uh, this was well, well, well uh, problematic, if we can say so, at the La Bibliothèque de France. Uh, the National Library of France in Paris, where Dominique Perrault used a lot of glass and then he had to put uh, oblongs inside to, you know, arrest the natural light, uh, light before arriving at the books. The waterfall building in Vancouver, 2001. Uh, this is a housing complex and it's kind of interesting. Uh, Look what he does with, uh, with that, those stairs that allow the, the, the apartments at the top to access the terrace. So these stairs uh, are almost, uh, you know, uh, kind of ornamental in the sense that they, they create something interesting at the top of the building. The fact that he brought them outside of the building uh, is beneficial because, uh, you know, the novelty of the scheme. Uh, sorry, this is not the uh, res resolution is not great, but I think you understood what what this is about. And then uh, this uh, this heritage center RCMP, uh, you know, a monolithical building, but be because of the curvature, slight curvature of the of the roof, uh, it has a certain lyricism. I don't know if, uh, in a way, this kind of building reminds me of. Uh, of uh, um, Christian de Portson Park. Uh, yeah. They, it has a slight expressionism at the corner. Otherwise, it's a, you know, a predictable building. Museum of Glass, this is a nice work, 2009 in Tacoma, Washington, uh, USA. It's uh, lyrical, it, 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 it uses glass, but in a almost surreal way. And, uh, you know, there are also these strange artworks. Well, he didn't do them, but uh, I guess he invited an artist to do them. And they are, they are, they are you know, uh, strange.
is. I don't, I don't know the function, but since it is a museum of glass, I guess they, they have this, um, you know, decorative uh, uh, function in a way, you know, it's the museum of glass. So then he plays these things, uh, you know, uh, outside of the building and they announce, I guess, the function of the building. I don't know if they have any other function. Arthur Erickson. I'm approaching the end of the presentation. Um, so, you know, indeed, John Ruskin was right. The most beautiful things are also the most useless. And he gave us an example, the peacock's tail and the lily. Well, here, these, these panels of glass, they don't seem to have a, a, a other function than to just uh, refer to, you know, the function of the building, but they, in themselves, they, they don't have a, you know, a specific uh, function besides the symbolic one. The Canada House in Vancouver, the Ericsson, I don't know what happened here. Uh, I guess I couldn't find pictures or the Ericsson, Vancouver, British Columbia. Yeah, I couldn't find pictures for these two works, but uh, you can see the Trump International Hotel from 2016. Uh, I hope this was built um, or was proposed. I forgot in what year he died, uh, Arthur Erickson, but, uh, uh, and I don't know if, I think it was built in, in, in Vancouver or it was proposed and not yet built. This kind of tower was, uh, was um, um, proposed by various architects. You know, this kind of twisting. Twisting is, is, uh, is kind of fashionable. And, um, you know, it's an interesting tower, but uh, uh, what can we say? The, the conceptual scheme, so to speak, is not very original. There are other towers like this and some were built. But as I mentioned, uh, twisting uh, is, uh, is a phenomenon these days. And I even have a presentation called uh, Twisted Architecture or Twisted Architectures. And um, one day I will show it again. So this was supposed to be built for Mr. Trump. And I think I am, uh, I am uh, approaching the end now of this presentation. Uh, with this uh, proposal for the Trump Tower. Uh, as we can see, the letters are big, uh, you know, for the big man, uh, big letters. And uh, the last picture of this uh, presentation uh, on Arthur Erickson is uh, with a compatriot uh, of ours, a remarkable architect who also worked in Canada and achieved uh, a lot of success there. And uh, on his uh, birthday on the 5th of October, uh, oh no, 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 he died on the 5th of October. I will make a presentation on him. That is Dan Hangano. I, I love that picture of Dan Hangano, uh, probably was, was taken in Bucharest when he was, uh, uh, you know, very young, maybe he's still a student. I even like his coat. I like the way he looks. And I also like the building he built in Canada where, as I said, he, he achieved great success. So um, with, this, with this image, uh, I, 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 I end now and I invite you, if you want, um, uh, on the 5th of October to, well, there is some time until then, but to, to, to talk about uh, Dan Hangano and pay an homage to him. Thank you.